Good afternoon. Um, my name is Bill Gray. I'm with the Minnesota Home Ownership Center, and uh, this is a this is an exciting day. I've I've got several folks at the table here with me. This is our inaugural um, Welcome Home podcast. We're going to try this initiative this year. Um, do do some podcasts, get some uh, information on on uh, home buying and and maybe foreclosure prevention if there's things going on in 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 your life right now. Um, but uh, today is all about um, what is the home ownership center? What does it do? How can it help you? Um, and uh, we've got some uh, great de- guests today. Um, let me say a few things about this. Uh, um, upcoming topics for this podcast, though, first, just so, so people know what we're planning on doing. So we're going to talk about the history of home ownership discrimination. We're going to try to answer the question, you know, is now the time to buy? Because that's always a good question. And there's always a nuanced answer to that. Um, COVID-related mortgage relief programs, a lot of stuff going on right now, a lot of stuff coming down the pike in a couple months, probably. Um, I want to talk about the Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance, which um, if you haven't heard of that, they we do a lot of good work uh, kind of dispelling some of the myths around home ownership that cause people to kind of self-select out of it. Um, and uh, we'll sit down with leaders of the um, uh, uh, Asia... A- Asian Real Estate Association of America, the uh, Twin Cities Chapter, the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, Twin Cities Chapter, NAREB, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Um, These guys put out a report every year on housing trends and that kind of stuff, and we'll bring in the the local heads of those organizations and ask them what they think about stuff. So, And then, of course, thought leadership and legislative proposals, because we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes. But today... We're going to talk about who is the Minnesota Home Ownership Center and how can we help you. So I want to introduce my guests. Um, uh, I've got Julie Guggen, who is president of the Minnesota Home Ownership Center. She works with me. I'm Bill Gray, by the way. Uh, I'm the stakeholder relations uh, director. Um, we got Julie. We got Rose Tang from. Uh, she works at U.S. Bank and Community Development, but she is also the vice chair on our board of directors. Thanks for for being here. And then we've got Henry Rucker. Um, Henry's one of our home ownership advisors, and he works in uh, Project for Pride and Living. Um, so, uh, like I said, a cool uh, program today, and let's get started. Um, Julie, let's start by having you give us a little background on the Home Ownership Center, maybe how it came about, how it's evolved and is evolving over time and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, the Minnesota Home Ownership Center was started almost 30 years ago, and it was started by folks in the home ownership industry, lenders, real estate professionals, uh, government leaders in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and at the state level, and nonprofits. Uh, 30 years ago, folks started talking about the op- uh, about lending products and are there adequate lending products for first-time home buyers and people who might earn um, a lower to moderate income. Do we have the right tools in place? And as the industry started creating those new tools, it also recognized that education needed to go hand in hand with those tools. In other words, helping people understand uh, the complex, sometimes complex process that goes into the biggest purchase that most people will make in their lives, which is their homes. And so our our founding members realized the importance of coupling homebuyer education, one-on-one advising, financial coaching with those access products, those first-time home buyer loan products and down payment assistance products. So that's how we got started. And that's been the focus of our work ever since. 
Very cool. And we're, we're a nonprofit organization. We get uh, funding from uh, the United States uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development for some of that work. We get foundation grants from uh, the likes of McKnight Foundation and others. Um, we do have them all listed on our website. Um, Gabe, maybe we could throw up the visual of our, of our homepage just so people can maybe see what's there. Um, and while Gabe is doing that, I'll turn to Rose. Rose, you're board vice chair for the center. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little about your background, your day job, and, and really why do you donate your time to, uh, to the center's work? Because that's what you're doing. You're donating your time. Sure, yeah. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for having me on your first ever podcast, too. It's a very exciting endeavor uh, to be involved in. And so my day job, I work at U.S. Bank, the Community Development Corporation, and I um, underwrite um, multifamily developments that use um, low-income housing tax credits to be built. Mm. And... I just actually started that. I'm pretty new to that. Started it last year in 2021. And before that, I worked for over 10 years um, in um, affordable housing policy and advocacy, and primarily to increase resources for affordable housing development across the full housing continuum. So including um, supportive housing for people who had experienced homelessness to affordable home ownership opportunities. And that's how I met um, I was introduced to the Home Ownership Center um, as a, um, and I was interested in kind of committing more of my time um, to doing work on on that home ownership end of the continuum, and really saw the Home Ownership Center as um, being a great leader in this space for advocacy. Um, in that area, so. that's great, and we're 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 lucky to have you, um, and and thank you for what what you do with the so with the uh, with the center, uh, Henry. I I want to turn to you. You're with Project for Pride and Living or PPL, uh, one of the nonprofits we work with to provide home ownership advising services, and uh, you're an advisor and a financial coach. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what that work is like. Oh well, thank you again for having me on the, the first podcast for the <laughs> HOC Home Ownership center um really what we do is we try to put, help you put together a roadmap for your financial success to become a homeowner then also be a successful homeowner for the next 30 years as we know when you do sign a mortgage you're going to sign a mortgage for 30 years but we help people with credit we help people understanding budget um how does it work when it changes from a renter to a homeowner mm -hmm. uh, we do soft pull credit reports we give people a real look at what their credit looks like today and what's going to look like in the future based on what they're going to the plan that we put together with them the lovely part about the network with the hoc is all of our services are free mm -hmm. okay so i think we really want to educate the community that it doesn't cost any additional money when you work with a financial advisor like myself financial coach uh counselor whatever term you want to put out in the community but the main goal is to make sure that roadmap that we put together for you is going to be a successful roadmap um we always like to say get ready be ready as part of the mm -hmm. hoa, HOA mm -hmm. you know home homeownership opportunity alliance uh as one of my very good friends always says it's never a hard no it's a slow yes yep. We really want to get, get people to understand that when you work with a nonprofit in the network, our main goal is to see you be successful. May, some people are going to choose maybe not to be a homeowner, but our ultimate goal would be to have you be a homeowner and be a successful homeowner. So that's really what we're looking to do is work with you from A to Z. Yeah, yeah. And that's great. And, and you're right. I mean, the service is free. Why would you try to do it yourself? Um, I mean, mean, you know, so we still are uh, struggling with that today. We, we're, <laughs> we're working on that magic answer. It's us trying to get the word out is what it is. Um, you know, I had no idea this existed when I bought a house. Um, uh, but anyways, yes, this podcast is part of that initiative. So, okay. So really important question. Why do we do this work? And this is really, um, something that you know when when i got to know the home ownership center and i got to um uh kind of dig in and, and and start looking at what this organization did and why it did it there were a lot, there was a lot that i didn't know mm -hmm. um and so maybe we can talk about that a little bit you know it's important not just to those we work with who were directly helping but it's important to society as a whole um I wonder, Gabe, we've got a uh, slide on the homeownership gap. 
um, and uh, and and the whole issue of of redlining, which used to take place. Um, yeah, there we go. So this is Minnesota's racial home ownership gap, and you can see there um, the white households up there at the top, white non-Hispanic households in that dark blue, all households, everybody together that's homeowners in that green there, and then the BIPOC uh, uh, ownership rate down there um, underneath everything. So you can see in, uh, I guess it was about two, 2020, the uh, white ownership rate in Minnesota was 77%, which by the way is one of the highest in the nation. And that's awesome. Um, for BIPOC households in Minnesota, however, in 2020, that uh, percent was only 43.6%. And um, here's the deal, and we'll we'll talk about this later. Home ownership uh, gives you an opportunity to build wealth, and it is the number one way that wealth is built in this country um, among individual households. And so these numbers are important way beyond the fact that you know you own a house or you rent. There, there's much more to this. And the other thing that I want to say about this, um, you can see the BIPOC ownership rate is about 43.6. The sad truth is the, the black ownership rate is, um, is about 26%. So that is a 50-point gap between white and black households in Minnesota. And that, uh, that gap is one of the largest in the nation. I think it's the third largest in the nation. And... Um, our organization does a lot to try to change that, and we'll talk about that later today. We'll talk about it in future episodes, but I just want to, you know, put on the table here, this isn't just about owning versus renting. This is about the opportunity to build wealth and take part in the uh, American economy, um, you know, to be blunt. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, let, let's have a little conversation about this. Um, Julie, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and... Think about your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think uh, households' reasons for buying a home vary. I mean, a, a home purchase is a very personal choice. It's a very personal path. And each household's plan to get there is different. I think what's important for, for the broader community to understand is that homeownership not only contributes to individual household wealth creation, and it does, we cannot underplay that. It's the number one wealth generator in this country by far, but it contributes to community vitality and safety. It, it contributes to children achieving better in school. It contributes to better physical and mental health. Uh, people who own their home earn more money. They're far more likely as you stabilize where you live and you're not moving every 12 months, you can stabilize your job, which creates opportunities in employment. So I, I do think it's important to think about individual household achievement of wealth and home ownership, but the contribution that that makes to us as a broader community is extremely important. And you know the statistics that Bill shared around the home ownership gap in Minnesota are staggering, and they've been like this for a while. We're uh, just now entering. Uh, policy reform era, I would say, that's starting to look intentionally about solutions for that homeownership gap. And yeah. I'll, I'll hold those thoughts now and let's hear what uh, Rose and Henry have to say on this question of why homeownership. Yeah, that, that is really exciting stuff. And we will, uh, I do want to have a, a, another show on that, some of those ideas, because they are exciting. Um, Rose, uh, what are your thoughts when you think about this, this situation here in Minnesota? Yeah, I think the statistics that you showed and, you know, everything that Julie was talking about, that's really powerful and impactful. And um, I think a tangible reminder for me is I live in South Minneapolis. And last year I learned about this project called Just Deeds, mm -hmm. which was um, – 
you know, which is trying to discharge racial covenants on homes throughout throughout the cities. And there's a tool on the website that you can look up your address and see if your house has a racial covenant on it. And um, those covenants, you know, restricted people of color from buying those houses when they were sold. And they're not legally, you know, binding at this point, but they still exist on these houses. And I plugged in my address and found not just my house, but the vast majority of my neighbors Mm -hmm. have homes that have racial covenants on them. And as a person of color living in a house that I wouldn't have been able to buy where like my, you know, um, it just boggles the mind. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's a kind of just very tangible reminder that the landscape that we have and the social and economic impacts are not accidental, that they are the result of conscious and intentional choices. And on the website, you know, this project, they make really clear that discharging the covenants, that doesn't undo the harm that was caused, but it's the first step in kind of naming that history and choosing a new path that I think centers equity and opportunity and the ability for, you know, building intergenerational wealth through home ownership, which, you know, as you and Julie both said, is the number one right. way that we build wealth in our country. And for me, living in that house, it's just a tangible reminder of needing to do this work and yeah. the amount of work that we have to do. This ahead was of us. really thought out stuff. I mean, the way that I understand that this worked is when a new housing development came online. And they did the um, the deeds uh, for each individual lot. They wrote in language that said, um, "No one of uh, Asian, African, Jewish." I mm-hmm. mean, I've seen I've seen bad words literally yes, in, the, mm-hmm. in the in the document can live here. Um, and if you sell to them, it reverts back to the bank or the previous buyer or something like that. It's just mind boggling. And um, and um, you know, the Just Deeds is a great organization that's trying to bring light to this um, for the um, properties that they have in their system. You can figure out if your property has one of these on it or not, but you can't take it out even today. Um, all you can do is, is um, what is the word? Um, uh, all you can do is... Um, state your intent against it. And there's a good word for that. I just can't remember what it is, (laughs) but um, you know, disown it, whatever it is I'm trying to say, put a, put a paragraph in there that says you, Mm -hmm. you, you um, disown that paragraph, but it's still there. Um, Yeah. When, when I came to this line of work, this stuff just blew my mind, but nothing blew my mind more than, um, Henry's father's story, and I'll explain this, and Henry's given me permission uh, to share this. In, in 2018, we, uh, the Homeownership Center, uh, launched the Homeownership Opportunity Alliance, uh, which we will talk about in another episode. And um, we, we kind of brought in someone to remind us why we were doing this work, and it was Henry's father. And as I recall, and I'll ask you to check my math here, um, uh, your mom and dad were, were were buying a home in a white neighborhood in the early 60s, I believe. Mm-hmm. And they just have to, ha- kept having to go through hoop after hoop after hoop for their mortgage. And if I recall correctly, your father said the last hoop they made you jump through was that you and he, he and his wife had to sign an affidavit that they would not have children for five years. And if they did, the house would revert back to the bank. And um, so that's if I'm remembering this right. That's what your father said. And I yes. was my my I, my jaw was on the floor, and I, what, you know. So um, yeah, I mean, what's your take on this stuff? Uh, well, my, my it's it's sad, and I, I will say this. I think it shows why I'm in the line of work that I'm in, mm-hmm. that my father continued to pursue that home ownership as they are still in that house to this day, um, and as. Everybody, want, everyone has mentioned so far. I mean, that's Wolf Creation. Uh, my mom and father live in the Field Regina neighborhood. Um, probably every house on their block is worth four fifty to six hundred thousand, mm-hmm. um, and they have no mortgage. 
And it helped me go through college. It helped mm-hmm. my sisters go through college. My father was able to use the equity in his house to help us pay for college. So when I graduated from college, I had no student loans, mm-hmm. um, which is truly a blessing. I don't even think people understand how important it is for young adults, as Julie mentioned, children should grow up in a home because we should start having generations that when they're in their 20s think about home ownership first versus renting. And if you're going to rent, you're maybe renting for three to five years where we're seeing people attend our first time home buyer class called Home Stretch that they've been renting for 30 to 40 years. Mm-hmm. And now they're buying because they want to leave something to their grandchildren, not their children. Mm-hmm. They want to leave something to their grandchildren because unfortunately some of their children have bought houses before the parent has bought a house. So that's why it's important to me why my father continued to fight that fight. And it's interesting because I go back to, I've been in my house for 20 years where, I, where my family lives. And I've said this before, I've never had a black neighbor on my block in 20 years. I never had a black home around my block in 20 years in South Minneapolis. And it goes back to what Julie also mentioned. I don't think a lot of people of color, especially African-Americans, believe home ownership is meant for them. And it does go back to some of the covenants that people had in their mortgages. And a lot of times when grandma, grandpa owned a house, they really weren't homeowners. They were renters. Right. But the children thought they were homeowners. And then when something happened to grandma, or grandfather, uh, the landlord would then knock on the door and say, hey, I didn't receive my rent from this month or last month. And the family was shocked. And then that puts a bad tone in their, you know, yeah. in a child's mouth yeah. um, or a grandchild's mouth that, you know what? I thought grandma, grandpa really owned this house, but they were really renting or they were buying on a contract for D that never yeah. really was going to end. Right. Um, the language wasn't right in that. But I commend um, my parents. Um, I can only tell people that not having student loan debt when I graduated from college was a true blessing. It's allowed me to support my daughter. It's allowed me to put things in place. So hopefully my daughter would not have student loans when she graduated from college. But it's also generational. The reason I say that is I own a house. My two sisters own houses. I've been in my house for 20 plus years. They've been in their houses closer to probably 25 years. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can put a value on that of the wealth that can help you create not just an equity, but then also being able to do things with your 401k, your 401b investments is astronomical. And I will always teach people this. The rule of 72 says your money will double X amount of years based on the, if whatever you're earning on interest goes into 72, if it's 9%, and every eight years that money will double. I don't think people understand that, right? Yeah. And that's where we come in as financial uh, coaches on the nonprofit side is educating people why you want to look at home ownership versus renting and what are the benefits of home ownership. So even if you're trying to put your kids through college or you are leaving it to your grandchildren or children, it's something that can pass on tax free. Uh-huh. And that's, I mean, we can't explain it any other way. Right, how to right. Build real wealth in America yeah. is through real estate. That is, that's fascinating. I'm, that might be a good topic for a, for a whole show. This is the rule of 72 and all that stuff. Because right. I'm not, yeah, anyways. Um, I will keep that in my in my head. Um, <laughs> thanks for, for, for sharing that that story though. Cause yeah, that, I just remember that just kind of blew my mind. Um, so, um I think now I want to uh, pull up some some graphics on the screen. I, I want to talk about some demographics of who we serve. Um, so uh, my colleague Gabe in the back there uh, will we'll throw some graphics up here. This here is um, kind of a, a just a slide that I put together on on redlining and covenants, and you can see the language in the deed for this property this is an example here um says that um the premises hereby conveyed shall not at any time be conveyed mortgaged or leased even rented Mm -hmm. to any person or persons of chinese japanese moorish turkish negro mongolian or african blood at descent, I can't even read. Or that. descent. Or <laughs> descent. Um, and uh, if they do, you forfeit your title. So, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that we're talking about that was going on. Um, I don't even, I wouldn't even say behind the scenes, but um, racism was built into real estate in, you know, as it, as it took off and especially as it really took off after World War II. Um, with the uh, GI Bill of Rights and the benefits I was just going to say, I think um, what both Henry and Rose talked about yeah. was intentionality yes. around this. The federal government, local governments, the lending um, institutions, and the real estate community contributed to this. It contributed to redlining. 
It contributed to deed covenants. It contributed <coughs> to discriminatory lending practices as recently as the Great Recession, where we saw that um, black and brown households were inordinately targeted by subprime lenders mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who um, sold loan products that essentially stripped equity away from individuals' households. We see it today in practices in the appraisal community. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the intentionality of this work this, the intentionality of this discrimination and racism goes back decades. And um, I think, it, it, you know, it's, it's to when Henry shares his father's story, it's to his family's credit that they were able to withstand the, the trauma and humiliation and frustration that was put in front of them by the system. And I think when we when we think about um, black and brown households aspiring to home ownership, we do need to pay attention to the fact that they were shut out for so long mm -hmm. that creating that aspiration and opportunity is is really on all of us. And it's going to require us to be intentional and thoughtful about it. It is. And one of the things that I think about when I consider all this is this, this is a bad deal for everyone. This is a bad deal, obviously for the people who were locked out, but it's a bad deal for everyone else because then you know, what do you have? You have an unstable system uh, that, that just is designed to not work for a significant part of the population. That's not in anybody's interest. Um, so, I mean, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but um uh, Anyways, a little bit of why we do what we do. So um, the graphics I'm going to go through now are, are from our annual report. This is going to tell us um, who the center served. Um, what year would this have been? 20, 20, 2020, I guess. Because, um, you know, annual reports take about five months to put together. So this is 2020 data. In 2020, we served about 23,000 households. Uh, eighty-nine percent of those were first-time home buyers. Nineteen percent were first-generation home buyers. Uh, sixty-three percent were households of color, and then we'll we'll talk a little bit more in a minute. We 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 helped five hundred and thirty-three households avoid foreclosure, and I'll and I'll come back to the foreclosure stuff about this. Um. One of the uh, things I want to make clear, our services and our advisors and, and all of that, education, all of these things, they're, they're free. As Henry said, sometimes the education has a small fee attached to it to cover the venue and whatever, $40. Um, but the advising and all that is free. And I want to make clear that it is open to anyone and everyone in Minnesota. Um, we have, uh, because of history, uh, we have gone as far as to say in our mission that we focus our outreach efforts, as in spreading the word, uh, uh, on uh, lower income households and households of color, because these are the folks that have uh, either self-selected out or been locked out and don't realize that things might be different now. And I mean, that's still debatable at some points, but um, we focus our outreach on that. So um, we're looking now a little bit deeper on who we served in the home buying side. So 89% were first time home buyers, 19% first generation. So you can see on the next slide, and this is going to be fun because I don't have my glasses <laughs> on. Uh, the mean, well, let's go back to the last one, Gabe, um, the previous one you just had up there. Uh, Okay, so the next one after that, perfect. Um, 43,200 is the median household income for the folks that we help. So, you know, some sometimes people say, well, I don't make enough money to buy a house. The median income for the households that we helped buy a house was 43,000. Uh, so we are working with low-income low families to achieve home ownership. And you can see there's some more details there divided out by our classroom ed, our advising, our financial wellness. Uh, and we'll talk about how those all get together here in a minute. Um, I, I have a slide that I've been tracking for a few years on millennials, 67%. 67% of uh, 
participants are millennials uh, for 2020. And then um, you can see they need help uh, improving their credit because the credit system in this in this country is 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 not intuitive. If I uh, choose to, you know, cut one of my credit cards for a department store in half, uh, so I'm not tempted anymore, I just cut my credit score because my um, total amount of credit available has gone down, and that's a bad mark on there. Um, and so uh, helping people to improve their credit, helping people to get their credit as good as it can be when they apply so they can get the best rate they can get. Because, and, and Henry can tell us this, the rate that you get depends on the credit score and it can vary widely. And a 1% difference in your mortgage over 30 years is lots and lots and lots of more money. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then you can see the last slide here, 63% of the households we served were households of color, and you can see the breakdown there. Uh, Gabe, let's go to the slide on the folks that we served as far as foreclosure prevention goes. 84% um, uh, of the households that we worked with last year to avoid foreclosure were successful in avoiding foreclosure. That's pretty amazing. I will say 533 is a very small number for what we usually help. And that's because 2020 was a very strange year. And we had forbearance and all these things that that helped people kind of uh, make ends meet for a while, put the payments off uh, um, in a in a systematic way. Uh, anyways, that number is low for 2020 just by definition. Um, you can see there uh, they remained in the house. Um, how that all works out, um, you can see by race, um, obviously with the ownership rate um, uh, in Minnesota, so heavily uh, uh, one rather than the other, 67% uh, of the clients we helped avoid foreclosure were white. Uh, and then we got household type, median income, that kind of stuff. Um, I think that's all my slides, uh, data slides anyways. Uh, so, um, I don't know. I think that stuff is is pretty fun to track and from year to year and and look at. Uh, so let's shift gears. Let's let's talk specifics about how the home ownership center can help you. Um, so um, let's see, Henry. Um, if I can ask you to uh, maybe talk about how homeownership advising works and, and the class and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, really, we're there to, I always tell people, if, when you, the first time you go to the doctor, they're going to run a baseline, right? They're going to run some tests. They're going to take your blood. They're going to do certain things for you. It's the same way when you're buying a house. Mm -hmm. When you're meeting with an advisor, we're just taking a baseline of where you're at today. One thing I love about Minnesota, we don't do slab on grade when we build new construction. Typically, we have a basement, which is the foundation, which right. makes it stronger. So if there's winds that come by, or tornado that come by, right. it's not going to blow the entire house down. That's what we're trying to do when we have somebody come in. Uh -huh. We get referrals from realtors. We get referrals from community partners. We get referrals from churches. We get referrals from other lenders where somebody may not be ready today. And I want to stress this again. If you're ever told no, you want to contact a financial uh, coach with a nonprofit yeah. in, the, in, in the network because – it could be the fact that that particular lender may not be to help you out, mm -hmm. but you could take a few steps. It might just be increasing your credit score. It might be increasing your reserves, your assets. Um, you know, one thing a lot of people don't realize is having a strong 401k, having some money in your savings account and checking account mm -hmm. helps your loan application. Again, you talked about credit. Um, if you never learned about credit as a child, the habits you're going to have as a young adult are going to go into your late 20s, into your 30s, into your 40s. Mm -hmm. So, again, we want to talk about how do you utilize your credit? If you have a thousand dollar credit card limit, you don't want to owe a thousand dollars. You don't really want to owe six hundred. You really mm -hmm. want to be under 30%. That's one of the factors that increase it, it, it is part of your credit score. So it's really educating people about the steps that they need to take to get mortgage ready. And then when they're mortgage ready, when they buy a house, make them long-term successful homeowners. As that we shot uh, slide showed, you didn't have a lot of people. You had 500 some people going for closure, but you were to help 84% of those. Mm -hmm. We want to keep that number at 84, 89%, yeah. 95%. And I think a lot of times people don't also realize when you buy a house, we qualify you in your gross income. You pay your bills this on your net. Key. So those are things yep. people want to talk about, right? Say, say that again. This is so key. And, and our friend Trent keeps telling this <laughs> to me too. <laughs> right. When you, when you qualify for a mortgage, they qualify you on your gross income. 
Would you pay all your bills on your net? Yeah. So one of the things we always talk to participants about, even when we teach the home stretch class, which is an eight hour class, uh -huh. um, it is $40. Um, but there are promos that are being ran out there right now by certain nonprofits. And we're, as you mentioned earlier with NARA, ARIA, yep. and NARAB, yep. they're partnering up with the nonprofits to help increase the enrollment for those classes. So you might get lucky and be able to catch one for free, right? right? But the difference is you're learning about the home buying process from lenders, from the nonprofits, from realtors that are also giving their time, like Rose is giving her time with right. the board. Right. They're coming there to educate you and make sure that you understand the process. Because the one thing I told people, as Julie mentioned earlier, the biggest decision to me you'll ever make outside of buying a house is who you're going to spend the rest of your life with, mm -hmm. right? Because, again, mm -hmm. it's a 30-year commitment. You sign a 30-year <laughs> commitment when you get a mortgage loan. So we want to make sure you're ready. I always also go back to the fact that it's it's having like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that when we refer you to three different lenders, that you have all the pieces of your puzzle in the box. So whatever lender right. opens up that box, they know you're credit ready. They know your income ready. Everything is good for you. And the lovely part about it again, it's it's totally free. Yeah, yeah. And and I want to reiterate, you said, you know, we'll send you off with three different lenders. That's what we do. We're, we don't just give you one. We don't have, uh, you know, a preferred something that we work with. We are, um, your work is unbiased. It's, it's you know, if you, if someone asks for a recommendation, they're going to get three options at least. Um, and I think, I think that's important. Right. Uh, so, so thank you for that. Um, uh, Julie, let's talk a little bit on the foreclosure side. Um, and this is a interesting time right now, um, again, because of COVID and the aftermath, but in some cases, there's some financial assistance possibly available uh, to homeowners who are struggling. And um, our advisors, our foreclosure advisors, can navigate that for you. Yeah, just as advisors can help people prepare to be a successful homeowner, they can prepare people to stay in their homes. We understand that things happen in people's lives a job loss, an income loss, a change in the household makeup, whether it's through death or divorce or marriage, um, a health care crisis. Things happen in people's lives. So our advisors are there not just at the beginning, but throughout the process. So we're, we really pride ourselves on the foreclosure prevention work that we do to keep people in their homes. Uh, it is a free service. It's available throughout the state of Minnesota. Most of the most of the programming is done virtually now, not in person. So it's it's convenient and available. Uh, because of COVID, the landscape has changed as it relates to foreclosure prevention. Interestingly, when COVID first hit, many lending institutions um, uh, created. Uh, forbearance programs, which allowed consumers impacted by COVID to stop making their house payment. It didn't mean they didn't know the money. It just meant they didn't have to pay it now. Most of those forbearance plans are beginning to expire or have expired. So consumers now owe all of the money that they didn't pay during that forbearance period. And different lenders are handling that differently. Yep. Some want their money now. Some are willing to let you pay over time. Some are willing to create a balloon mortgage at the end of your original 30-year term. There are just a whole host of features that different lenders and different investors are offering. In recognition of that and in recognition that many households are still feeling the impact of COVID and the, and the crisis that it caused in their household. Um, uh, several communities, cities and counties in Minnesota are using federal dollars that are available on financial assistance programs for those homeowners who qualify. You're behind on your mortgage, um, you can demonstrate that you had a COVID crisis, you income qualify for the program. Um, income limits vary anywhere from 50% up to 100% of AMI. Um, and uh, foreclosure advising is required if one is to get the financial assistance. But nevertheless, the programs will pay up to $35,000 for um, back owed 
property taxes, mortgage, principal and interest, uh, insurance, and in some cases, utilities. So those programs are available in Minneapolis and Hennepin County, Ramsey County and St. Paul, and Dakota County for right now. Mm-hmm. So, um, and the Homeownership Center is managing those programs, but we're working very closely with our homeownership advisors to make sure that consumers have support during that process. I think it's also worth noting that the financial assistance that's paid out is paid directly to the vendor. So mm-hmm. we pay directly to your mortgage company or to the county if in the case of taxes, et cetera. The funding does not go directly to the consumer. But um, we've we've managed to help hundreds of consumers in the last six months that we've been doing that. And we're continuing those programs into 2022. Yeah, it's a good example of the, um, the navigation that our advisors uh, provide because... You know, I, I I know some of the details on these programs. I've written some of the uh, news releases on them, and um, they're complicated. They're really complicated. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, um, a foreclosure advisor can sit down with you and figure out what all of this means for you um, and, and can help you figure out what you need to do, uh, you know, to get your application submitted. So they may need income verification, stuff like that. They, these guys can help you with all that instead of you trying to figure it out on your own on a web, on a website. Um, let's see. Um, let's talk about, uh, some of our experiences purchasing, um, purchasing first houses. Uh, one of the things I thought about when when Henry uh, was talking um, is o- home ownership from generation to generation is kind of like a snowball. Um, you you talked about all the things it allows you to do, um, you know, put money in your four hundred one k, do all these other things. Uh, it allows you to show the next generation that this makes sense and kind of you know be the role model in a way for that. A lot of times. Um, it allows uh, the previous generation to assist the new generation with some money for down payment and that kind of thing. Um, and of course, that's not available to someone who is a first-time home buyer. It's not available to everybody, um, mm-hmm. or to it's not available to lots and lots of people. Uh, but anyways, um, um, you know, uh, how did your first home ownership if you're comfortable sure, yeah. uh, go i mean were you overwhelmed by the process i remember i was sitting in a dairy queen signing some papers for one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars in 1997 and i was like <laughs> what what this doesn't even make any sense how do i ever have that much money but anyways uh yeah t- t- g- give us some insight into your own experience yeah well when i purchased when we purchased our first house, we were, um, I was working in, you know, housing policy and advocacy and was lucky enough to know about the home stretch class. Mm-hmm. And, uh, some of the organizations that I worked with already were, um, uh, part of the network. And so could find a list of the classes and find, an organization that I already knew and trusted. And so I took the home stretch class with uh, PRG, Mm -hmm. which is a nonprofit in Minneapolis. And that was super helpful for me because I had probably never met a real estate agent before. I didn't know anything about the inspection process, like that whole binder of information that they give you. I didn't, I really did not know any of that. And just if it's okay to go into a little bit of personal history. Uh-huh. You know, when I um, moved to Minneapolis to uh, go to the University of Minnesota, I was really lucky to get to support a professor um, who was doing a research project on how the foreclosure crisis had impacted uh-huh. um, the immigrant community in Minneapolis. And one of my like research assistant tasks was to go down to the Hennepin County Government Center and read all of these mortgages that Mm. have been foreclosed on and read the terms and kind of see, you know, for myself, like, you know, trying to find some patterns in sure. some of those And that didn't scare you away. And that was very scary <laughs> in fact. And so that just knowing, just seeing, you know, all this language that I, that right. 
you know, you wouldn't necessarily know how to understand without some assistance. And then my, my mom, when she moved to the country, she, you know, kind of in our like household lore, she likes to talk about how she had saved up all this money to come to America and she had $400 in her pocket and that was all she had. She lived in, you know, student family housing on campus and, um, I don't think she felt supported in her home ownership sure. process. And um, so between those two kind of experiences, I knew that I really wanted that support and advice going mm -hmm. into um, my first home buying mm -hmm. journey. And so I um, took the home stretch class and met with uh, the home ownership advisor from PRG who kind of helped understand, you know, what a budget would look like, you know, kind of just what, what amount of house, you know, would be, um, comfortable for me. And that was, um, that was, I, I, I really needed that support because yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. So, um, I think that's just a really valuable resource. And right. Um, appreciate that help. So. Good, good. Yeah, I mean these these real real world experiences. I mean that's what we're talking about, Julie. I mean it reminds me you you, you talk about your own experience buying your first house sometimes, and I know that's one of the reasons you like what you do for your day job. So tell us about that. Yeah, as opposed to Rose, I did everything wrong. <laughs> uh, I uh, My realtor was a friend's husband who had never, I, I was his first client. He'd never <laughs> sold a house before. Um, he was not networked as a realtor, so he had little advice for me about lending products. I coincidentally, I, I was single, and young, I was under 30, so it's a long time ago. Um, and coincidentally, just coincidentally, I stumbled on a first time home buyer loan product. I purchased in the city of St. Paul. My interest rate was 8.8%, wow. and it was an assumable mortgage. So that's how long ago this was. 8.8% was a significantly better interest rate that I could get than I could get anywhere else. Um, the down payment I used on my um, $52,000 house in St. Paul came from a very small inheritance that I got from my grandfather when he passed away. Um, my grandfather was a second generation immigrant in rural South Dakota and managed to run a successful family farm with help from the government in purchasing his property and making his farm a success. So I had that legacy for my down payment. But yeah, for the I joke with my friends now, for the first six months I owned that house, I would have dreams or nightmares <laughs> at night thinking that I had done something wrong <laughs> and I didn't actually own the house and somebody was going to come knocking on that property and it was no longer going to be mine. So uh, I, I, you know, I sought advice from my parents. They had purchased homes before, but they weren't the level of advisors that I needed. Mm -hmm. right. So I felt, I felt, I felt unsupported yep. in the process and wish I would have had the support of a homeownership advisor or at least knew to look out for that. And the fact that it's available for anybody is, yeah. you know, is, is really critical. I, uh -huh. I had a college degree. I had a base level of education, mm -hmm. but knew nothing about purchasing yeah. a home. Yeah. So. Very, very. That's my story. That's I needed Henry right. at the time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, the, the thing I want to do now, and, and Julie, you probably remember this. We worked with a woman named Tom, Tamla, um, and uh, she was kind enough to uh, to work on a video with us. Um, and it's uh, just kind of a success story video that kind of shows you maybe the, uh, you know, a, a, a client that, probably typifies a lot of the um, kind of households and, 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 and individual circumstances uh, that we work with. So uh, I know Gabe is getting that up here. And, uh... Having a large family made housing tough for me. You know, even with me having good rental history once upon a time, you know, my landlords wasn't really trusty to rent to you with five kids. Having no resources 
you end up with bad credit or no credit. And then me coming out of 14 years of abusive relationship with my ex-husband, he left me totally in debt with five kids. I learned so much more from the homeowners program through HAP, the type of house to look for, for the type of things to ask for, from keeping my credit together, managing my money better than I was managing it. I definitely would recommend to anyone to go to the Home Scratch program. It gave me a lot of insight and knowledge that I wouldn't have never been able to gain just on my own. Working with the Home Ownership Advisory gave me hope. You know, I didn't have hope. I was hopeless. This was a dream. Even though I worked all hard towards all the things that I wanted to do and I had goals set and I kept pushing forward, but I didn't believe in my dream until I got with the Home Ownership Program. They helped me regain hope and then I started to believe in it and then things started to happen for me. I just feel so empowered each day I wake up, you know. The last thing I need to worry about is where I'm going to live at, you know, or what I'm going to eat. I think no one deserves to have to worry about where they're going to live or what they're going to eat. For personalized guidance on starting your own journey toward home ownership, connect with an independent advisor today at hocmn.org slash buying a home. Such a, a great story that she was able to share with us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I know y'all at home heard that just fine. It was a little low volume in the studio here, maybe. But uh, Henry, I don't know if you heard enough of it to kind of tell us. I mean, how, how does her situation compare to, um, you know, some of the typical situations that you see? Here's a here's a person with a, a few kids. I believe she had an adult uh, a kid with some special needs, and they're all having to move from apartment to apartment to apartment. And this just totally, you know, ch changed her paradigm, um, right. you know. What I saw, first of all, was pride. Mm -hmm. um, to mm -hmm. me, you could hear it in her voice. Uh, you could hear, you could see it in her. Um, I think the ability to go from being homeless to having a house, um, something mm -hmm. that you physically own. Mm -hmm. um, I tell people, I think there's a lot of pride in being able to paint the walls whatever color you want to, yeah. uh, put any furniture that you want in there. Um, I also think it's a sense of pride for the kids to be part of the community. Um, as I tell everybody I work with, and I think as a network, Rose even mentioned PRG, mm -hmm. there is no competition, right? So ADC was in the African Development Center was in that uh, video. We all are working together. <laughs> you mentioned that there was 22, I think, thousand households, right, that we yep. worked with. Yep. That's enough business for all of us. Yeah. And again, we're not paid commission. Right. So when we see those success stories with an individual like that, it's empowering <laughs> other people that may want to be a homeowner that says, you know what, I was homeless or I don't know if I can yeah. make it. So that's why we got to have to share those type of videos yeah. and let people know that homeownership is really, anybody can achieve homeownership, right? right? I, I need people to understand <laughs> There might be a five hundred thousand dollar house. There might be a hundred fifty thousand dollar house. Everybody's situation is going to be different, right. and we're trying to put you in the situation that best fits your needs. Right. That's one that I want to be very clear for. Everybody's right. needs are going to be very different. Very different. Um, some people need a three bedroom. Some people just need a one bedroom. Some people might need a four bedroom. But what I got from that video was the the sense of pride of in ownership, knowing yep. that this is a goal of hers. She accomplished <laughs> that goal. I think going out to the mailbox to get her yeah. mail, her own mail. And that was her a own, fun shot right. to do. You know, I think yeah. that that that's important empowering you know yeah. it's not in a box yeah you know where you yeah. gotta kind of go through and pick out your mail or it's not being left in a in a front office of a, of a rental unit it right. was her own mailbox that she was walking to get her own mail right i think that's empowering and i think we can't even put a value on the impact right. it's going to have on her children right. to grow up in a house as julie mentioned earlier i think sense of neighborhood um one thing i noticed a lot and we're not going to get too deep in this about yeah. love letters right? yeah, yeah. When people are writing offers it's better to say, hey, I went to this park, I went to this elementary school, I went to this junior high school, I went to this college. I grew up in the neighborhood and I lived there for 15, 20 years. Yeah. That does make a difference for some sellers. Those yeah. are things we're trying to get rid of. Yeah. But if you've never owned a house, right. you can't write anything like that. <clears throat> right. Um, and I think, you know, just having the participants that we work with see videos like that is empowering to them. Those are things we talk about in the home stretch class. Yep. As Julie mentioned, you know, having even that gift from her grandfather yep. got her over the finish line. Right. Things like that. That's why it's important that we have conversations with advisors because 
There might be a family member that could give you a gift. There might be down payment assistance that you qualify for. Mm -hmm. Julie also mentioned about a program she used. A lot of times the buyers don't know about those programs. Mm -hmm. And working with people like, you know, in the <laughs> network helps you get to those programs right. to get you over the finish line. Right. Um, so it's very important. Now, all I can say, again, there is no charge to work with an right. advisor in the network. Right. Um, I recommend everybody start with an advisor and then... For sure. When you pick a realtor, you pick a loan officer, we're all part of the same team. Yep. And 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 here's one of the biggest things that I, I want to make sure we don't lose track of. Tamla and the people that we serve, she did that for herself. She had some guidance. Right. She had some guidance from someone who actually knew how the process worked. So it was helpful guidance. Right. Um, but you got to do the work. You do the work yourself, um, you know, and uh, you achieve it yourself and you own it. You, yeah, I mean, you literally own it, but you also own it when you're done. You were able to do this and you had some guidance from uh, people like you and, and, and people at the other organizations where we have advisors, Habitat for Humanity, Urban League, you know, all over the state. Uh, one roof up in Duluth. I could go on and on, I'm sure. But this is this is something that's that's possible and that you are able to achieve on your own. You did this mm -hmm. when you're done. And I think that's super, super important. Um, well, we are um, kind of coming to the end of our, our first uh, mm -hmm. podcast episode. This is... This is a, this has been exciting. Um, I want to uh, make sure that everybody knows um, if you want more information on the home ownership center and the services that we offer. So that's like home buyer advising, foreclosure prevention advising, and some of these education classes. Our website is hocmn.org. You can see an email and a phone number up there. Um, Reach out anytime. If you call us, um, you may get a voicemail, but we uh, we get those and try to return them uh, every day. Um, it's kind of our intake call center kind of thing, um, and we would be happy to um, to uh, connect you with an advisor so that you can explore this for yourself and see if this is something that uh, might be of interest for your own situation. So. Um, Let's see. I want to acknowledge um, some sponsors we have for this initiative. Uh, we have um, Associated Bank, we have Chase, we have Midwest One Bank, and we have Old National Bank. Uh, these um, organizations, individuals from these organizations, uh, play a role in our outreach. They're um, interested in what we do. They participate on our um on our groups that are going out into the community and spreading the word around on this stuff. And they very generously uh, offered to um, support this initiative uh, a little bit. And we are very appreciative of that. Um, in March, we'll be back here again. And I think we'll talk about the Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance at that time. So um, that'll be a good show. And uh, with that, I'm going to Call this uh, call this a wrap, and um, thanks you guys for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time on the Welcome Home uh, podcast. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.